He's been bringing you the news from all over the world, the things visible and invisible, known and unknown for the past 19 years. Coming up on EWTN Live, we'll talk one-on-one -on -one with EWTN's very own Raymond Arroyo. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome on Father Mitch Packwell and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest tonight has come all the way from Washington, D.C. Mm. He has interviewed a number of newsmakers through the years, from actors and sports figures to presidents and future popes and even our own beloved Mother Angelica. Mm. And he's here tonight to share what he's learned through the years of sharing those stories with you. So please welcome Raymond Arroyo. Good to see you, Father. Good to see you, too. Thank you for having me. It feels like I'm back home. I know. It. We haven't changed I love what thing. you've done with the place. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's the same. It and, looks uh, great. I was thinking of getting some rocking chairs and a hitching post, but they didn't go for they it. They didn't. Well, maybe yeah. that can be another show. We'll get a donkey out yeah, there. Yeah. After The after party. Yeah. EWTN, <laughs> the after party. We'll do it out on the porch. Sure. So, Raymond. Uh, you have been very busy. You're living in Washington. Yes. And that seems to have been a really good opportunity to get to have a variety of guests mm -hmm. that probably weren't able or willing to fly to Birmingham yeah. on your old Friday show. Right. So right. you can meet with them on Thursday and, and talk to yeah. a lot of newsmakers. Yeah. Uh, have you enjoyed being over there? Well, it's a different world. I mean, it's it's there's a, there's a danger of being in D.C. And the danger is you start thinking inside the bubble. And I try to keep myself in it, but not of it, mm -hmm. because it's all politics all the time. And yeah. as my friend yeah. Richard Newhouse used to always say, uh, Father Richard said, this is a one game town, my power, my oh, power. Right. And he said, if you're not very careful, it could become an idol and it could crush you. He was right. Oh. And I see that all the time. Oh, so I, it's neat to be there. I travel a lot. Um, but it's a, it's a fantastic uh, view on the world, the country. It's the nation's capital. It's a world capital. And that yeah. makes yeah. for a great, you know, uh, nexus for our news operations. Yes, very much so. And, you know, one of the things that um, uh, you, you are, have done over these years is that I mentioned in the tease, yeah. uh, you've done a lot of interviews I have. of uh, different folks. We're talking now about having a new kind of show. Yes, this is the big news of our, of our, yeah. our time together. Uh, there's a new show that EWTN will be premiering. It's already, the first episode has already sneakily gone out. Uh, the next one airs, or aired earlier tonight. It's called Conversations the World Over. And what it is is kind of a reunion for our longtime viewers, and I think it'll be a revelation to new viewers. And what it is, is the best interviews over the last 19 years with newsmakers, religious leaders, politicians, artists, actors, directors, uh, really taking you inside so many sectors of the culture and allowing you a front row seat. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, the terrible thing about what we do is you do it and it's over. Mm -hmm. So this is a chance to revisit it. And when I go back, it's been a joy for us to kind of go back and watch this because so many of these interviews, you think you know what was said there, and when you go back and listen and look at it through the lens of contemporary events, mm -hmm. they take on whole new meanings. Mm -hmm. So that's been really uh, fascinating, and it's, it's a quick half hour. It premieres in the United States on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Uh, I think it's 5, or is it 5.30? 5.30. I think James, my producer, knows everything yeah. he knew. 5.30 uh, Eastern 5 .30 time? 5.30 Eastern time. Okay. Uh, in the United States. So it'll be right after WTN. the uh, nightly news on Wednesday. No, it's actually before the nightly news. Yeah, it's a half hour before okay. the nightly news. They're on okay. at 6. Oh, okay. So we're on at 5.30, then 6. Yeah, I see. I did make the change the time, right? Because it's on That's at 5 That's right. Here. You're, you're yeah. central time. Yeah, right. So, uh, so it'll be on at uh, 5, 5.30 Eastern, uh, Eastern time. time. 
and right before the nightly news show on right. Wednesday. Right. And we'd like to just take a look. You know, we have a couple clips <laughs> uh, of some of these. One of them is with then Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell us a little bit about it and then we'll take well, a look. Well, this, this is my favorite interview, I mean, that I've done. The most challenging, absolutely, but clearly one of the standouts. He is such an incredible mind, uh, one of the greatest theologians alive and certainly mm -hmm. in the church. And then to have him become Pope Benedict on us was pretty incredible. Yeah. What I love about this interview is in the middle of it, I asked him in passing about his desire to leave his office, to retire, when he was head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. This is when John Paul was still Pope. Right. His response was fascinating, particularly now what we know about his landmark resignation as Pope. Sure. Let's take a look at the clip. You've been here for 21 years in this post, and I, I've read in many reports you wanted to retire several times. Why are you still here? <laughs> yes, I had uh, decided to retire in 91, 96, uh, 2001, uh, because uh, I have said yeah, I could write some books and mm -hmm. return to my studies as Cardinal Martini did. Right. So it was my idea to do the same thing. But from the other hand, seeing the suffering Pope, I cannot say to the Pope, I will retire, <laughs> I will write my books. <laughs> uh, seeing him. Yeah, and. You know, he did continue on yes. until the death of St. John Paul. Correct. And he celebrated the Mass and preached. Yes, he did. Uh, and he preached at the beginning, you know, before the conclave mm -hmm. began. Right. And ended up not being able to retire yet. Well, he eventually did retire. And I mean, that's yeah, what but, I, but I, I love. But not when, he's when he said, how could I retire? I was perplexed, frankly. I remember that day, it was 5.30 in the morning and I, I, the phone started ringing like crazy. It was CNN, wanted to talk and, and can you come on now? And uh, I said, what are you talking about? And they were telling me Pope Benedict retired. Well, I had forgotten about this bite, what he told me here. I mean, here he clearly says, how could I retire given the example of the other Pope watching him? Yet he, he eventually did. He eventually <laughs> did find a way to do this and um, internally, I guess, came to peace that this is what he should be doing. And now, curiously, he's doing just that. He's writing books, playing his music, he's praying. It's kind of a retirement in the Vatican Gardens. Yeah, I, and I had on uh, uh, Ralph Martin as mm -hmm. a guest uh, right around the time of the retirement. Mm -hmm. And he had been with him at the synod that fall, previous fall. Oh. And he was amazed at how he had physically declined. Oh, yeah. And so that, you know, that, that he'd gotten much visibly weaker. Yeah, well, but just this past week, I had people I knew, friends of mine, mm -hmm. who went and were part of, he has a group of scholars. He has a yes, little, uh, that's right. an annual meeting. Every September. And he preached twice. Uh, he, the, he ate with them. He's been accepting visitors. He seems to be ready and rested here for something. <laughs> so well, that's it. You know, and it's he, amazing. He did, he, he did seem to pull back, but he was yeah. No, he was down. declining. Yeah. But he looked. Everyone says he looks great. I've seen some recent pictures, and he seems to have bounced back a bit. Good. So that's good. God that is bless a good him. thing. You know, he's been a great, great servant of Christ and the Church. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to this new series, now you. You're not really letting much moss grow on you, even though it is kind of humid in Washington. Well, I got to keep you moving. You don't, yeah, you keep moving. That's right. So you've also been doing some writing. I have, I have, and um, branching into fiction a little bit, which is something I'd never done before. Hardest thing in the world. It's not quite as hard as shooting those bucks that you like to shoot, but yes. almost that hard. You know, I often wonder about that. I was thinking the other day, you couldn't be a Franciscan and do what you do. No. You know, they no. couldn't go out there and say, hello, Brother Buck, Brother Deer, bam, bam, that wouldn't happen. No. So it's good that you're a Jesuit. I, and I thought, look, the Jesuits now want to be Quartermain. You know, next thing they'll want to be Pope. Oh, sorry, we already did that. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. you got that. But, uh, but no, so I'm writing now. I am writing, and I'm writing fiction for kids, for young adults, and it really, you know, when I started this, I intended it for kids 10 and up. As I got into the writing, it really is applicable for the whole family. It's a supernatural thriller. It's an adventure. It's called Kerman Derman and the Relic of Perilous Falls. Wow. And it is, this is the first of 
a number of books. At so least you're planning a series. It is a series, and it's all laid out. And I've done the first. I'm in the middle of the second. Um, it's a fun series. It's it's got a supernatural angle to it. Um, I think it has the adventure. It's a little scary around the edges, which boys like when I spoke to librarians don't, and educators. Don't you think girls like that too? Well, they do, but they, they do, don't. They like a little bit of a, well, a scary also, stuff. But they also like relationships, and there's plenty of that here. I have a, a female heroine, uh, Kerman Derman's best friend, Cammie, and his great aunt Lucille is central to the whole series, and she does some incredible things. But I kind of describe it, this is my tongue-in-cheek one-liner on it. It is Dennis the Menace meets Indiana Jones in The Exorcist. <laughs> okay, that's kind of the, now it's not quite that scary, but it's close. Yeah. Um, it's a wild ride, I, and I think what I've loved about it, reading it to children, my own and I was going to say, your own kids were involved yeah. in the process. Very much so. How, how did they like it? I have never, ever audience tested a book while in progress. This one I did, and I would convene groups of my kids' friends of various ages, 15, 11, and 8, and I would read chapters to them. And kids will tell you, that's terrible. That character's boring. I mean, they come right out with it. So, you know, I went back to the drawing board and threw plots out, rearranged, killed a few characters, created a few new ones. They love the ride. Kids today expect a fun, consistent ride. They want surprises on every other page. So this book delivers that, and I hope they'll keep reading, and that's my intention here, to have cool. something the whole family can discuss. It's got a little meat to it. Um, it's, it, it delves into history. It touches in, into a lot of the uh, even biblical relics. Uh, I, think, I think people will love it when it comes out. It won't be out till the spring, though. Okay. All right. So, Good. That'd be, that'd be great. But it's coming. Yeah. And, you know, there have been, uh, just because you, we have you here, uh, to deal with uh, some of the issues going on. There's a lot taking place. This is not a dull no. news period. I'll say. There, there's yeah. a lot going on yeah. uh, in the, the, the world at large yeah. and within the church. What, what, hmm. you, what takes are you picking up well, uh, about, say, the situation in the Middle East right now? Well, the Middle East situation is a quagmire. It has been since the invasion under the, the Bush administration mm -hmm. going into Iraq. Yeah. Um, at the time, uh, for the last... St. John Paul warned he did. against it. He did. And for the last 14 years, we have been consistently reporting, speaking to Chaldean bishops from the very... F before the invasion, mm -hmm. Uh, about the possible impact to this Chaldean community. As you well know, more than most, this is the ancient reservoir of faith. These are our first brothers in the faith. Mm. And they speak the language of Christ. This is the Aramaic. It's yeah, for them, a lot of folks don't understand. Yeah, no, no, but no. A, they are not Arabs. No, they're not. They, they are kin to the ancient Assyrians and Babylonians, the mm. Akkadian people right. that lived there before the Arab invasions yeah. of the seventh century. They're the natives of exactly. Iraq. So they, for them, Arabic is a second language. Yeah. First language is Aramaic, wow. the Chaldean dialect, which is an mm -hmm. Eastern dialect. You, there's, uh, there's a village or town in uh, Syria that speaks yeah. the Western dialect right. called Syriac, mm -hmm. and they've also been Devastated. No, no, it's cleaned out. It is, it is effectively ended. The Chaldeans, the Assyrians in the region, yeah. they're gone. They're scattered. Now, some of them are holed up in the north. We don't know what will become of them. I had Walid Faraz on the show last week. Yeah, he so. and some other uh, officials are attempting. They went to the UN. They're trying to find not a safe haven, but a refuge, a permanent refuge that would be protected so these people can rebuild their lives, have protection from the Kurds in the north. Uh, this ISIS is a malignancy. It, it really is now the grown child of Al-Qaeda Iraq. Right. That's where it sprang from. Right. And it's now and bled over the border of Syria. And, and for folks to understand, we were talking, uh, not with you, but we were at dinner today, mm -hmm. that at the core of all this... Why didn't you invite me to this, dinner? What was well, well, no dinner? No, no, not for you. Yeah, I had the, crackers on the plane. Thanks. Go you're on. welcome. The, um, uh, you wouldn't have liked it. Okay. The, but the, 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 the thing is at core of Al-Qaeda mm -hmm. and now ISIS, which is Al-Qaeda without as much conscience, 
Mm. It's the one way to look at them yep. without a conscience and without any constraints of natural law, yeah. but rather the doctrine of the Wahhabi sect of the Sunnis, mm. which is from Riyadh in uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Arabia. And this is a 1740s movement mm. that has come up and down mm. over history, but for them, everything is the oneness of God. Tawhid is their key mm -hmm. book. And in that, if anything is associated with God, it, it's called shirk, you know, association. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it has to be all eradicated. And they have redefined everybody outside them as unbelievers or infidels. Right. And that's not just an insult. Well, that's why you it's, have. It's a legal term that means you are liable to being killed if you don't accept Islam. Well, that's why you have Muslim on Muslim crime exactly. there, and people are like, well, what are they doing? Well, this is these are strains of religious thought within Islam that, frankly, we're very ignorant to yes. here. Yes. The Chaldeans on the ground aren't, the no. Assyrians on the ground aren't, nope. and they were warning about this at the beginning. So yes. we'll see. The president will announce a plan. We'll, we'll, we'll drop bombs in Syria against the, the, the ISIS, which are the rebels, okay? Mm -hmm. The majority of the rebels in Syria that we have been sending money to, training, sending weapons to, are part of, or will soon be, part of ISIS. This is what happened in Iraq. That's, the guys running ISIS are the former Republican guard under Saddam Hussein, yes. uh, who felt who, ostracized religiously and, oh, and abandoned. Uh, and see, one of the things too, at first that Republican guard was a purely nationalistic movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I oftentimes have compared Saddam Hussein's government to a Nazi government mm -hmm. that had been taken over by the mafia. Mm -hmm. He was a murderous criminal yep. from the time, he killed his first man when he was 10. Yeah. And so he had this criminal background. He took over this nationalistic movement, and now they are taking their nationalism and lack of ethics with this Islamic, uh, you know, Wahhabi mm -hmm. uh, ideology. Mm -hmm. And that combined, you know, you have people with no conscience. Yeah, no, it's, it's a bloodbath. It's it a is. bloodbath. And I can't even relate the pictures. I, I have friends in special forces who were there. Um, when you talk to these guys and you see the images of what they walk in on, what's happened <laughs> to the houses, particularly of the Christians, yes. uh, uh, the Assyrians, the, the, uh, the Yazidis, Yazidis. Yes. Um, it is barbaric. I, I, I can't describe it, but it's, the, it's brutal, bloody, horrible. And see, this is one of the things too. Most people don't understand that this is very rare in Islam. The last time any movement exactly like this came mm -hmm. up was during the Crusades. Yeah. There was a group called the, As the Assassins. Well, this is why the Crusades were launched. And, <laughs> and the Crusaders and the Muslims there worked together to end the Assassins right. because they were so vicious. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, everybody thinks the Crusaders hated the Arabs. They, they, sometimes they lied on right. various issues. Right. So it's, you know, this is a rare movement within Islam Mm -hmm. but it is vicious and yeah. there is no justification mm -hmm. for it. Well, and then, so there's that. We've been covering ISIS and this situation in Iraq for years, particularly the Christian minorities, right. what they're facing, what life is like for them, and now they're scattered to the winds it's and they, they need our help. And then at home, we've been covering the stuff on Capitol Hill, the budget, we've got elections coming up. And then New York has become the epicenter of Catholic news <laughs> over the last couple of weeks. Unbelievable. Owing to the Fulton Sheen cause. What, what's, tell us what's going okay. on there. Fulton Sheen, as you know, um, this, I, I have a personal connection to him because Fulton Sheen was very important in the conversion of my wife, Rebecca. <laughs> and I made a deal with him. He was long dead, but I made a deal with him. Went to St. Patrick's, promised him, if you can help this girl understand my faith, and maybe soften to it, I will get you back on television, was a deal I made with him. And when I came to EWTN, Fulton Sheen was not here, right. but I did a little documentary on him. They got such a good response, they eventually began airing him, and 
he's still on EWTN, so I love that. And, and uh, all, I remember too, but, but even when I came, because I was a few years before you, we uh, were trying to get them. Right, and couldn't get the rights. we couldn't get the rights mm -hmm. because the, the estate was colorizing and other stuff. Yeah, there's all so kinds the, of things uh, happening. So, so, the, so that was important what you took that step yeah and helped us to well, get on the I air. Didn't do it. I think Sheen did it. But uh, 12 years ago, a group of people got together. I was among them. I was on the, the Sheen board uh, to, for a cause, the Archbishop Fulton Sheen cause. And it moved ahead. On two occasions, New York, where his body is, was given the opportunity to advance the cause. Cardinal Egan said, no, we've got two other causes, to Saint and uh, Cardinal Cook. Why don't you see if somebody else will take this. So the Sheen Foundation picked up its marbles and went to Peoria. Bishop Daniel Jenke happily took it. Right. Uh, uh, Sheen was uh, raised there, ordained a priest there. Right. It was a natural place for right. it. The cause has moved ahead like quicksilver and now we're at the beatification stage because he has a miracle. Right. Well now there's a huge imbroglio. It's been approved. It's been approved. It's right. done. All that re is needed now before the beatification ceremony is according to the Congregation for the Cause of Saints, you have to inspect the body and get first class relics. Well, there is now this kind of loggerheads between Peoria and the Archdiocese of New York because New York does not want to open the tomb or allow access to the body. This is a problem. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of back and forth. I have some new information that I will be sharing Tomorrow. On the world over this week. Okay. Um, some things we've come into contact with, some uh, folks I've been talking to over the week. Very interesting. It'll shed new light on this. Ditto for the St. Patrick's Day parade controversy. Um, Cardinal Dolan and really the organizers uh, of the St. Patrick's Day parade have al uh, allowed gay groups to march for the first time in yeah, the parade. Yeah, and I think it's important to clarify the organizers of the parade allowed a group from NBC News Correct. that was a, a gay group to march with their Just banners. Just one, and now, out NBC. And then, and the Cardinal said, well, I'll go along with the decision mm -hmm. of this right. committee. And now more groups are petitioning, are and, petitioning. And, and trying to get in the parade. Right, right, you know, I'm, I imagine it's gonna be NBC Universal is, is the uh, group. And, um, you know, and the, you know, this, uh, is something where, you know, well, well tell me what you know. Well, this, I, I'll tell you a little bit and then I, I, I don't want to give away my show tomorrow night. But um, part of it is you have to understand on that parade committee is one of the executives at NBC. So this is why there was a special right. carve out for NBC gay folks. Now, you have to bear in mind, gay people have been marching in the St. Patrick's Day parade probably forever. They just weren't doing it under a banner. Right. That was always the problem. The, the parade organizers didn't want any group. There's no pro-life group. There's not nuns for St. Pat's. They're, they're not groups under banners. And this year, that will change. Well, the reaction has been volcanic. Absolutely. On the internet, our phones have been ringing off the hook. Um, we'll see what happens in the coming days, but I know there's a lot of back and forth going on. Yes. Cardinal Dolan is the Grand Marshal of the parade, and on the record, I'm not saying anything anybody doesn't know, he said this is a wise decision. Yeah. So that has, you know, yeah, I, and I, rubbed I, some I, people the wrong way. On the other yeah. hand, he says it's a parade. It's not a sacrament. It's not high mass. It's a parade. <laughs> people will have to decide yeah, how to interpret that. The, the, the difficulty is going to be that it's a parade about a saint who was a great missionary to the Irish in their sinfulness. They were not a virtuous group till he got there. You just lost all the Irish people in the audience, you know. Oh, they'll be bragging about this because they were great <laughs> fighters. And this was a group, Ireland was so rough. None How the, rough were they? None <laughs> of the barbarians invading Europe even tried to go there. Oh. <laughs> they, they, because the Irish fought like madmen. Well, they were afraid of the snakes. No, uh, was, no they were afraid of the Irishmen <laughs> who would strip naked, paint themselves blue, and chase you with an ax. Nobody wants to fight that kind of guy. <laughs> so this is something that, you know, that, and St. Patrick transformed them into this place where monasticism 
became yeah. the most influential yeah. institution, not the naked guy painted blue. Yeah, well. And they also, well, the barbarians were ruining all the literature have you been oh, to, the have Roman you been, Empire. Have you been to Kendalock? That, no. That beautiful, Glendalock, the beautiful, uh, that monastic ruins there. Yeah, just what you're but, talking it's, about. But, but this is where they preserved the books yep. of the Roman Empire. Yeah. Well, the pa barbarians destroyed them, they saved them, and then they brought them back and taught the barbarians how to right. read and write. This, is, mean, a this, good, this is a wonderful segue. Teaching barbarians how to read and write. Yeah, well, that's another job you're doing. <laughs> Let's talk Let me, about Before that. we skip okay. from New York, I just want to give one other New okay. York story. All right. Of course, there was the loss of the Joan Rivers, the yes. comedian. Yes. Now, why would I bring that up? I don't know if you I, I was remember. Gonna ask. <laughs> on her last show, yes. Uh, her last TV show, her guest was Mother, Mother Angelica. Angelica. Yeah. Mother had written her book, Answers Not Promises. Yeah. And her mother's the uh, person who does all the publicist kind of yeah. stuff yeah. said, well, Mother, we've gone to all the nice shows, and uh, I guess we'll just stop the, you know, doing the yeah. book tour. Yeah. And she said, I don't want just the nice shows. I want to go where they're sinners. <laughs> so the publicist called up Joan Rivers yeah. and said, that's Mother like to go where they're sinners. said, oh, oh, bring her here. I got lots of sinners. Yeah. So, <laughs> and she came? And she came. Yeah. And she had Joan Rivers in tears. Yeah. You know, uh, of, you know, she was just so moved by mm -hmm. Mother. Meanwhile, there was a rock band that went nuts. Yeah. They, they, they went berserk on the stage. They had to <laughs> cut them off. And Joan was in tears. And it was the next day she lost her show. Yeah. And then the next day her husband committed suicide. Right, shortly there. And Mother, yeah. uh, I think it was just two days after the end yeah. of the show. Yeah. And so, uh, and Mother had been there. And it was something that, you know, I remember that Mother then contacted her at their losses mm -hmm. and, you know, offered uh, prayers and condolences. No, they had, a, they had a conversation apparently in the green room, as mm -hmm. I remember she mentioning this. And uh, apparently Joan sort of poured her heart out to her yeah. um, and, you know, told her, look, they're coming for the show. It looks like they're going to take the show away and I don't know what we're going to do. And Mother prayed with her. And so there was really, yeah. this is the beauty of Mother Angelica. Yes. She was willing to go out into the middle of the culture, wherever people were, without regard for what people might have thought or where things, she was going to bring a message of love and faith. She was strong. She was funny. She had great humor, and that was her entree, I think, into that into the whole pop culture sphere. And whether it was there or with Dick Clark and Ed McMahon on the Blooper Show or with Larry King, she was where the people were, yeah. and that is important and remains important, yeah. I think. We've got to take a break. We'll be back in two minutes. We want to get your questions and comments, and we'll even give Raymond a little chance to talk about why he brings up Irishmen teaching barbarians how to read. <laughs> so stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, first of all, I want to invite you to come here and join us in our audiences. If you can be part of the live audience or uh, if you uh, can bring, come as a group or as individuals, as families, we'd love to have you. Please contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to the website ewtn.com. They'll give you information about the scheduling of programs, the masses, of course, 
tours of the studios and also uh, information about places to stay, places to eat, some of Raymond's favorites like the Irondale Cafe, get your fried green tomatoes. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> He loves that Bring your Pepto Bismol. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's good food over it there. It is good. Just, yeah. You know, <laughs> tough on the digestion at this point, Father. I'm not 20 anymore. That's right. But uh, we'd love to have you come and join us and be part of uh, our programs and share with us in the masses. You ready for some questions? Come I'm on. game. Let's start off. We have Francis. Hello, Francis. Hello, Father Mitch. How are you doing? Fine. Where are you from? I'm from Grand Ledge, Michigan. Grand Ledge? Where's that? We're about uh, 10 miles west of Lansing, Michigan. Okay, all right, gotcha. And your question? Well, first of all, first of all, Raymond and Mitch, I think you guys have a wonderful ministry with this program, with this show and everything. But my question for Mitch, with the help of God, with the graces of the Holy Spirit, and God, Jesus blessing you, would you look at the future, prog would you look at the future program for EWTN News? Well, I would think you would want to talk, not talk to me. I, I see, let them keep going. These are young folks. Um, in terms of, uh, I'd rather have Raymond talk about the future of I'd EWTN rather have news. you talk about the future of EWTN I Then no. I say, keep reporting it. Yeah. No, we, we, look, we're going to continue to evolve and grow. Um, that's already happened with the, the new nightly news show. Uh, we're doing this second show here, the conversations uh, from the world over. We will continue to bring you live events, breaking news. Uh, you know, the website is very robust these days because of our partnerships with uh, the National Catholic Register and CNA. So th there's actually a lot going on. But, you know, you, you, Mother Angelica always lived in the present moment, and I think we all do, and you sort mm -hmm. of find that next thing you're called to in that moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, we'll grow and change and evolve when the time comes. And it's happening as we speak. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. let's take a question from our studio audience. And sir, where are you from? I'm from uh, Dave from Belmont, North Carolina. Right. And I have a question. Raymond, you said you had uh, one of your favorite clips. Right. Uh, do you have a least favorite interview that you did? <laughs> yes, I do have a least favorite. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a perverse favorite. Um, what my, went on? My most difficult interview, Yeah. and I mean she was honor, and God rest her soul. She was a Broadway legend. Elaine Stritch was her name. Uh, people will probably best know Elaine from uh, 30 Rock. She was Alec Baldwin's mother on 30 Rock. But she was in films and television for years, and Broadway... Uh, her entire, for 45 years, she, she tread the boards. So I had long listened to her. I'd seen her so many times. We went to interview her before one of her shows. She was the niece of Cardinal Stritch in Chicago. Who was the Cardinal when I was a little boy? Wow, that mm -hmm. explains a lot. Uh, no, <laughs> and anyway, we did the interview. Elaine was in rare form, and I barely got a word in edgewise. Huh, let's take a look at a clip of that. Let's turn the mics on, or you won't get anything worthwhile. Reverend Mother Rademacher and you had quite Rademacher. a... Rademacher. Rademacher had quite a relationship. Say it like it is. I, I know you'll make me, and I want you to. There. Reverend Mother Rademacher and you had a... Rademacher. Rademacher. That's it. Had a close... And, and Marlon Brando was one of your classmates. Sat next to me in school. You dated him a little bit? Yeah, everybody would think that was just the gift of a lifetime. Not you. Pain in the... <laughs> Is no. what he was. The conductor, the great d conductor. What's what's his name? The famous, famous conductor. West Side Story. Uh, Come, Bernstein. 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 Leonard Bernstein. Who said that? Chris. What do you do for a living? <laughs> He's my producer. Yeah, well, He's... oh, you're his producer. Oh, good. I'm glad it. it isn't the other way around. <laughs> you're where you belong. I've seen you, I have to say, since I was about that big. Did you imagine... Do you, you did you ever here? hear any of the jokes about Betty Davis? I've loved you ever since... Wait a minute. I haven't asked you the question yet. When Betty Davis said, I, when somebody comes up to her and says, I've loved you ever since I... You should know better than that. You're <laughs> hip enough to know better than that. I, Elaine, I have seen you ever since I was... Boy, are you looking for... A, <laughs> 
I'm sorry. I'm guilty as charged. Unbelievable. I mean, you are the proof positive of what all those jokes are based uh, on. How do you want to be remembered <laughs> as a performer, as a individual? As somebody who cares about enough about her career and entertaining an audience so that she can level with her interviewer before the show that she's got to go. That's how I want to be remembered. <laughs> That's how and you'll tell be remembered. And tell the remember. truth. How about that? Thank you, Dora. All right. It was Love nice you. meeting you. you, nice talking to you, and Great now let go of me. You're gone. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and she is gone now. Yeah, God rest her. Oh, no, no. This, let me tell you, if you can survive that without, you know, responding in kind, yeah. that takes great fortitude. But you see, I love that. And the reason I love it, great interviews are always about that relationship between the parties. Mm -hmm. It's never about one or the other. And she was such a larger-than-life woman, also terribly diabetic, and I think we were in the middle of a little episode there, but <laughs> she was way out there. But I love that. Yeah. I, 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 I find that, you know, it's, we are so starved for life and conversation today mm -hmm. that I think when you see reality like that, you should capture it and bring yeah. it into people's homes. It teaches the young how we are to live, and you live large. Yeah. You laugh large, you fight hard, you enjoy, and you love life and, and, and the people around you. And yeah. Elaine Stritch taught us that maybe in a little way. Let's take another call. Hello, Joe? Hey, uh, this question is from Raymond Arroyo. Sure. Uh, what is the greatest thing you've ever learned from Mother Angelica, mm. and who was your favorite guest on The World Over Live? I'll hang up now. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Well, I, I told you, my favorite interview is Cardinal Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict. Uh, my, my favorite, my personal favorite will always be the Mel Gibson interviews. Um, Mel is such a wily, brilliant uh, artist, somebody who sees the world in his own way, and a, another person who is larger than life. Uh, but brilliant, and you really have to prepare when you sit opposite somebody like Mel. Uh, so I, I, I cherish those interviews that we did before the Passion um, in Rome when he was shooting it, and then later, you know, just before the release. What did I learn from Mother Angelica? That's another book. Um, I will tell you the one I, I brought it up a little earlier. When when I was here, when I was here in Birmingham, um, Mother would always catch me running from one thing to another. She said, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? And I said, well, I, I'm, I, I got a deadline. I have to do this. She said, you know what your problem is? You're always in the future. You're always worried about what's coming. Sweetheart, live in the present moment. Well, I never really understood what that meant until she taught me. And it's about embracing the responsibilities and doing what you're called to do right now in this moment. That's all you have. And to, 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 to get your stomach in knots about the future or to worry too much about the past is not going to get us anywhere. And she knew that, and she lived that. Yeah. And um, that was, that, that's one of the many things she taught me. Um, she's still teaching me. Sure. Oh, she's yeah. still teaching me. Yeah. You know, uh, let's take another caller. Hello, Chris? Yes, Hi. Father Mitch. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. And your question? My question is, as a practicing Catholic, what can we do for the refugee and persecuted Christians in Iraq besides mm -hmm. praying and giving money and contacting our senators and representatives? Yeah. Well, Chris, already I'd say that you've got a good start. If you're doing that, that's a good start. But yeah. What else might you think? Well, the Chaldean Church, something that's not getting enough publicity, and I've been trying to bring some attention right. to it. Yeah, the, Chal so I, yeah. the Chaldean Church has a website, and it's helpiraq.org. What I like about it is, and this takes nothing away from the other efforts, because lots of people are raising money. What I love about this effort is it goes directly from the Chaldean Church in America to the Chaldean Church scattered throughout not only Iraq, but into Jordan and other places. It goes directly to them, and there's no middleman at all. Right. Uh, that, I think, is a proactive, wonderful thing that we can all do and should do, because they really need our help. These people literally fled for their lives with only the clothes on their back, and sometimes they didn't even make it with their children in tow. The children were snatched away from them. Unspeakable things um, are being done now to these children particularly, and again, I, I, 
I wish I could talk about it, but um, it's barbaric stuff. Yeah, it's yeah. really ugly. Just um, you know, just to be alert. You know, they're actually crucifying and beheading children, and this is yep. unconscionable. That's the that's 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 it, a pleasure trip compared yeah. to the pictures I've seen. Yeah. Um, I'll put it this way: they are brutally sexually abusing these children and then decapitating them and yes. doing these other things. It is a, I mean, it's something out of a, a horror film. It's, and if you saw the pictures yeah. of mothers uh, awoken out of their sleep and held down and things driven down their throats, it, it's unspeakable. Yeah. It's just unspeakable. And when our guys go in, this is the scene that awaits them. This is the intensity of the violence there. So we have to pray, but we also have to do more than that. And I think aid is important. One, one of the things, too, that I want to add, um, I, I heard this on, uh, I believe it was CNN, uh, just yesterday or the day before, that they'll say things like uh, ISIS or ISIL is attacking the Yazidis and others. Mm. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it, the, the, that they don't want to admit that the primary targets have been Christians as well as the Yazidis, right? As as well as Shia Muslims well, and and others, but they 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 just mention these others and other minority groups. Yes, but yeah. these are Christians, and it's one of the reasons we keep emphasizing this mm -hmm. is because. The other networks won't even say the word Christian sometimes because mm -hmm. they, they, sometimes I almost suspect that their own uh, animosity toward Christianity in the West keeps them mm -hmm. from presenting the, you know, the, the reality of what's happening to these people who are innocent. But, or as I heard from one yeah. guy recently, um, you know, that all this is happening because of our involvement in the Middle East. This has nothing to do with our involvement well, in the Well, I mean, no, it, we, it, we, 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 were, we, we provided, I think, the kindling for the fire. Well, we, I mean, we, I don't think that's a stretch. Right, no, that's not, and, and I would say that we, what we did is we took away the protection Correct. that the Christians had from Saddam Hussein. Right. Ditto for Mubarak. And ditto for, for Assad. Assad. Mm -hmm. Ditto for, I mean, but, and that's but the question. Are you better off uh, allowing the Muslim Brotherhood and these, these fractious radicals right. to proliferate, or do you leave the despot in place? Right. Does that hold the lid on, on, exactly. on the, on the but, destructive well, elements and keep civil society alive? That's but an here's, open question. here's the thing. The fact that America went in to be involved in any of this mm -hmm. is not why ISIS or ISIL, as they call themselves now, no. uh, is attacking the Christians. No, no, no. That, that's what I mean. No. That, you know, yeah, we messed up the situation. They were doing but, that but before. But this is, this is something that they are not doing this because of America, but they're doing it because of their own hatred of anybody who disagrees with them slightly. Yeah, with their, with their thread of Islam, their there, there's Islam. no There's no room for any other kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have another question. Hello, Patrick? Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, where are you from? Houston. Great, and your question? Yes, um, I read in your uh, newspaper, The Register, an article about uh, the committee for the St. Patrick's Day Parade allowing openly gay groups to march this year, right. or next year. And, um, uh, His Eminence Cardinal Dolan agreeing to be Grand Marshal. Mm -hmm. And my question is, I'm seeking your discernment about this issue. I, I personally find it scandalous. Um, mm -hmm. I think as Shepherd of the Flock, it makes no sense to me that he would yeah. lend his office to marching in the parade as Grand Marshal. I wouldn't think St. Patrick would even do it as Bishop. Um, and I'm curious what you think about that. Oh, you're handing the hot potato to me, Pac. Well, well thanks. you're the guest. Well, yeah. I already, I mean, I've already, uh, I think I covered it. Um, in Cardinal Dolan's, I can only share with you what I'm reading and hearing his justification for all of this is. And it seems he looks at this as just a civic event. It has a Catholic tie, but it's a civic event. And it is the determination of that parade committee to decide who marches and who doesn't. The cardinal doesn't, you know, say, I shall legislate, this is who will march or not. Um, I do think there is concern warranted 
that you have an official, an Archbishop of New York, saying that this is a wise decision that, and, being, and agreeing to be the Grand Marshal. Now, let me tell you, there, there's, very, there's a very good possibility here that between now and March, Cardinal Dolan may have to excuse himself as Grand Marshal of this parade. I've been hearing that in the winds. Um, it's a, the situation is just uh, very complex because it's not really in the church. It seems to be an inside corporate deal, as best I can see it. Uh, tied to the rights. NBC owns the rights to the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Uh, the, the official, the executive at NBC sits on the parade committee. He got the carve out for the NBC gay group alone. So there seems to be some corporate and financial intrigue here that at this point we don't have full transparency on, but it's becoming clearer. Now the challenge is, do they allow pro-life groups, do they allow other groups to march under their own banners, or is it just this one NBC-affiliated gay group? We'll it's, see. And see, and this, this is one of the things where uh, at that point that these corporate decisions are being made, mm -hmm. that I, as a priest, would certainly have to say, if you're going to do your corporate thing mm -hmm. and do so in a way that undercuts the very meaning of what St. Patrick did mm -hmm. by dedicating his life to the moral and religious conversion mm -hmm. of the people of Ireland, then I must undercut my presence there. Well, that, I, mm -hmm. I could not, if, if they want to go this route, mm -hmm. If that's what they, if this is all about business, mm -hmm. then you do your business okay. and let it lead you where you're going. Well, that's the question. And your parade may not end up where St. Patrick did. Yeah. And this is the kind of thing that I want to make sure that I, as a priest, mm -hmm. would be leading the flock towards the goal that St. Patrick pointed out, yeah. namely Almighty God Himself. Right. The shamrock is not about Irish nationalism mm -hmm. or the color of the country. It's about God who is one, mm -hmm. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that this other nonsense has taken on shape as we see in the commercials around St. Patrick's mm -hmm. Day, where idiot 20-something-year-olds are running down in their pajamas looking for a keg of beer yeah. to celebrate St. Patrick. Mm -hmm. This all is a commercial abomination. Mm. And if Guinness Stout doesn't want to advertise unless mm -hmm. let them well, take th th their beer the where they're going. This but is the issue. We have to take our people to Christ. It was a Catholic, always a Catholic event, a Catholic parade. And the Archbishop of New York has always been a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I was there when John Cardinal O'Connor would go out on the steps of St. Patrick. He wasn't in the parade, but he was blessing it, waving. He was there. It was an official in an official or semi-official capacity. It will be a big challenge this year to well, figure out how it retains its Catholic identity in light of this decision, but it, they'll have it, to figure it, it out. It sounds like the corporate mentality is undoing yeah. you know, what would be Catholic identity and meaning. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, I also remember that Cardinal O'Connor made mm -hmm. sure that he would not mm -hmm. go along with right. anything that was counter to our faith and morals. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we have to be firm on. Yeah. We have another caller. Hello, Mary. Hello, Father. Hi, where are you from? I am from Washington State. Great. And what's your question? Well, it's, okay, I'm supposed to do it quickly. You know how in the Old Testament, when Moses was sent down to get the Israelites out of Egypt, and they wanted to go and worship God, and Pharaoh wouldn't let them, right. and God intervened. Mm -hmm. Being that we're one nation under God, our religious freedoms are being eroded. Uh, the culture is a culture of death, and you know we're, not, we're nowhere near being persecuted as much as our brothers and sisters throughout the world. But do you think that since we're not, we're under attack, you know, um, in the sense that our rights are being taken away, the little sisters of the poor are having to pay for birth control and whatnot. Do you think God will intervene to help us 
um, continue to be able to worship him? That's Frank, a spiritual question. Well, you take that well, one. Mary, as I, I say about so many of such things, that is a management question, <laughs> and God is management. I, I don't know, I don't have a prophetic gift to, to call that down or to point it out. I, that's, I, I can't do. What I can do and what you are doing is pointing out, as all of us must, that the culture is doing a lot of things to try and undercut our identity as a nation, which has, you know, and it's one of the things that always bothers me about President Obama. When he cites the declaration that we all, we have the uh, inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. he skips the next part, which says, from the Creator. Mm. So we don't have those rights from the state. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the state has no right to take them. Mm -hmm. They're given to us by God directly. Mm -hmm. And if we undercut God, and we see so many groups doing whatever they can to remove any mention of God, any basis for moral discussion in our school systems, and then they substitute morality for self-image and having self-confidence, which, by the way, is always strongest in one particular group, psychopaths. <laughs> psychopaths have absolute self-confidence. Mm. And ISIS would be an example. Yeah. I have no, they have no problem with self-confidence. Mm. The lady, and, asked, the lady asked an interesting question that I'd just like to give her a little bit, something I saw today. She asked, would God intervene? God is always intervening. God intervenes mm -hmm, constantly. True. Um, there was a woman on, a, on the plane with me today, and she, an African lady from Johannesburg, weeping, sobbing, sobbing, from the time the plane took off to the time it landed. And in the middle of the thing, I, I, as we were packing up to go, I said, look, are you going to be okay? Are you, are you all right? And she said, I'm fine. And she shared a little bit about what she was going through. And the man on the other side of us took her arm and said, I'm going to pray for you. And I said, I'm going to pray for you too. And she said, you all have made my day. Now I know God is with me. You never know. You don't. That's but that's true. the intervening. I mean, God, we, we, we have to get away from this notion, and I think it is a notion we all have, that God is somehow floating in the ether and he comes down with a long beard and he's going to, you know, right all the wrong. We are the hands and the mouth and the feet of Christ and God. That's and the intention. We, we, we have our role too. He no doubt supernaturally can intervene and do all sorts of things and he does every moment of every day. Um, but I worry about waiting for the great leveler to come and knock right, it to, right. we have always had discord. Before the birth of Jesus Christ, there were hundreds of little kids that lost their heads over that, right. before that birth. Not the, not the sweetest way to come. You talk about religious persecution, there it is. We're, thank God, facing nothing like that. And I think we have to put all of this in some context and realize God has not abandoned us. Right, but we, also have to make sure we don't abandon God. Correct. And mm -hmm. give up either by saying, oh, the heck with this, let it all right. collapse around me. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just going to wait for Jesus mm -hmm. to come back. No, that's not our role. No. It's always that sensitivity, like that you have kind to of... be proactive. You have exactly. to be proactive. You know, yeah. with the lady from Johannesburg. Yeah. All this is what we have to keep on uh, being alert to and how God can use us, like, the question about what can we do for the Iraqi Christians. Yeah. You look for those opportunities mm -hmm. and try to get at this in any way we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a good thing. I agree. Well, you know what? What? We're running out of time. Running out of time. You didn't even let me talk about my literacy initiative coming. 30 seconds. No, 30 seconds. It's called Rays of Wonder. It is a, a literacy initiative that will not only help 
give parents strategies to teach kids lifelong learning and a love of reading. It will also recommend nourishing books with real values and tradition that they need exactly. to put the world into context. We'll talk about it in the coming Yeah, days. yeah, you, you'll certainly have uh, this on your show, but you it, it's an extremely important kind of no, thing. No, we, we have an illiteracy crisis in this country. Absolutely. 22 million new adults added to the illiteracy rate every year. Exactly. 22 million. And this is going to be another way where we can intervene and let God use us yeah. to teach them how to read. Well, let me give you all a blessing. Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Raymond, I want to very much thank you Always for joy. Thank having you. you for being over here. And also want to remind you, we can have Raymond's new show, his old show, his old self, <laughs> my old self on this show, and <laughs> do all of this because of you. You bring this network to you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills. They didn't go off on vacation in the summer. They're not on vacation now. So help us out. Thank you.